Welcome, cardiology updates, viewers and listeners. I am Shadi Reyes, director of the Cath Lab at Detroit Medical Center in Detroit, in the United States. Today, I will be talking about some of the highlights of the European Society Congress 2023 that took place at Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. There were many interesting studies, for starting from heart failure, EP, as well as in interventional studies that were presented. I will touch briefly on uh, 13 kind of highlights that were picked by our editor. Starting with the first trial, it's a stiff, a stiff HFPEF, very interesting trial looking at a very new angle for a known medication. This study, study explored uh, if uh, semaglutide could be used to target obesity-related uh, uh, heart disease failure with preserved rejection fraction. So this study, the investigator looked, uh, studied more than 500 adult patients with HFPEF who were randomized to semaglutide compared to placebo. Patient receiving semaglutide showed a greater change in the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire Clinical Summary Scores at 52 weeks compared to placebo. Semaglutide was also associated with a greater change in body weight than placebo, which we know this is the main indication for the medication. Patient taking semaglutide showed a greater reduction in C-reactive protein, uh, which is inflammatory marker compared to placebo, and patient also taking the medication improved their six-minute walk to a greater degree than patient with placebo. Again, this is a new medication, has been uh, in the market in the United States and Europe for, for some time, has an indication for diabetes type 2, but recently has been approved also uh, for weight loss, but this is a new indication for the medication for patient with HFPEF. Moving along to NOAA FNET 6. This is an epixaban trial uh, and looked into if epixaban could prevent stroke or cardiovascular death in patients with atri uh, atri uh, atrial high rate episodes. A composite of cardiovascular death, stroke, systemic embolization uh, compromise the primary endpoint, and in a composite of death from any cause or major bleeding compromise the safety outcome. Following the median of 21 months, which is the study period, the trial terminated due to futility and safety concerns. Exipexaban did not significantly reduce the incidence of primary endpoint as compared with placebo. Additionally, the safety outcome event had occurred more frequently in epixaban than placebo. Although this is a negative study, the epixaban still has an indication for atrial fibrillation with non valvular AFib, but this is again a concern for patients who have a high rate uh, episode of atrial uh, uh, rate episodes. Moving along to another AFib study called uh, COPAF or COPF, it's assessed uh, if colchicine reduces perioperative atrial fibrillation and myocardial injury after non cardiac surgery in patients undergoing thoracic surgery. Uh, we know that colchicine is anti inflammatory, has been used and indicated for gout, and has also indication for off label use in patients with pericarditis. So, this is a prevention, primary prevention study. Clinical important preoperative AFib or atrial flutter or um, major non cardiac and, and patient non cardiac surgery within 14 days of randomized uh, compromised the dual primary endpoint. AFib developed in 6.4% of patients assigned to cochicine compared to 7.5% in patients assigned to placebo. And also, uh, myocardial injury after non cardiac surgery events occurred in 18% in patient assigned to cochicine compared to 20% assigned to placebo. These results were not clinically significant. Again, it's a good uh, attempt to see if this cochicine has a preventive uh, property to reduce the inflammation in patient going for thoracic surgery to induce AFib. Moving along to the next trial, it's called QUEST, Q-U-E-S-T. Uh, this has explored the effect of uh, Aquila quangicin in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. This is a new uh, kind of category of medication and uh, is a traditional Chinese medicine uh, formulation. Investigation randomized a study into three, more than 3,000 patients with HFREF, meaning reduced ejection fraction, 1,500 to the medication compared to 1,500 plus in the placebo. The primary efficacy outcome event uh, was a composite of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke and heart failure worsening and readmission, and the median follow-up was close to 20 months. A primary outcome event occurred in 25% in the study group, and in the placebo was 30%. And, uh, uh, and this has showed a, a, a favorable outcome in the study group compared to the placebo. Next study also, again, related to the uh, 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 iron study for patients with HFREF is called heart 
FID or hard FID, uh, explored the efficacy and safety of intravenous IV ferric carbomalitase uh, in HFREF, meaning giving patient iron for patient with HFREF. And in this trial, they randomized more than 3,000 patients with a reduced ejection fraction, less than ejection fraction of 40, to IV, uh, IV uh, iron compared to placebo. At 12 months follow-up, all-cause mortality was 8% uh, uh, with the infusion compared to 10% with the placebo. And hospitalization for heart failure was also lower, 13 compared to 14 with placebo. These results were deemed to show marginal improvement, uh, which is, again, this is, uh, again, one of the things that uh, we should be vigilant of, as well as an option for a patient with low iron, as well as anemia with HFREF. The further trial, uh, next trial, examined outcome of complete revascularization in elderly patients with myocardial infarction and multi-vessel disease. In this trial, again, this is um, an, a, a, a more one step further to study this cohort of patients who comes with multi-vessel and how and when we can intervene on them. In this study, investigator wondered if complete revascularization would improve prognosis and also oh, uh, complete uh, improve uh, heart failure down the line in patients who are elderly. They randomized more than 1,400 patients. They are all above the age or equal to 75 year old. And MI, uh, to, uh, who present with MI at NSTEMI and undergo either complete VASC or culprit only. At one year, a cardiac event occurred in 15% of patients in complete vascularization group. By contrast, 21% of patients in the culprit only group experienced a cardiac event after one year. The secondary outcome of the CV death or MI was also lower in patients who had undergone complete vascularization. This is very interesting study. And again, this is a subgroup for, of patient in terms of uh, age group selection, but again, goes in favor of uh, recommending a complete vascularization. The question remain when we can fix these patients, especially they're elderly, maybe they have some CKD, creatinine cannot tolerate contrast exposure, maybe stage it. And when do we stage it? Within seven days before discharge, 30 days or one within, within three, three months. This question still was not answered by this study, but again, it favors complete revasc and elderly patient. Very interesting study next is ACLS shock. And this is very important study. I would like you to uh, kind of, uh, I, I think it was one of the highlight that was important uh, in, the, in the ESC 2023 that evaluated clinical outcome with extracorporeal life support, which is ECMO, alongside revascularization in patient with MI and cardiogenic shock. Revascularization could occur either via percutaneous intervention or bypass surgery. So basically, somebody coming with an MI and shock, have an ECMO, and then the patient underwent TCI or coronary artery bypass surgery. The ECMO uh, did not reduce three days mortality in patients with acute MI complicated by cardiogenic shock who are scheduled for early revascularization. Also, there were more safety concerns in the patient who received ECMO as compared with the patient who did not. This is kind of shed the light on the fact that mechanical support is important, but patient selection is very important as well. For example, somebody comes with flourish shock, lactate more than five or seven, and the patient already been in shock for some time, even with revascularization and even with patient with uh, a shock, with ECMO, you're not going to be salvaging much. So again, this is an important study, add to the uh, help us how to guide therapy in patient with MI and shock. Moving to physiology and imaging, Illumian 4 has been uh, presented and published simultaneously, explored the use of OCT guided PCI in patients with diabetes and or with complex coronary intervention. Investigator wondered if it could achieve better post-PCI lumen di dimension and clinical cardiovascular outcome than angiography alone in these patients. Again, this is not an IVIS compared to OCT. This is an OCT compared to angiography. OCT guided result in a slightly larger lumen, minimum extent area than uh, angiographic guidance. A very obvious outcome because you see more, you guide more, you size better. However, there was no difference in the per percentage of patient of target vessel failure at two years. Therefore, the Illumium 4 uh, failed to show that OCT guided PCI is superior to angiography, especially with heart outcome and patient undergoing PCI. Moving along again, still with the uh, imaging and intervention is Octavus trial. Uh, uh, this is a compared outcome using OCT guided PCI with intravascular ultrasound guided PCI in patients with obstructive coronary artery disease, stable, as well as some NSTEMI cases. 
Octavus also followed uh, more than 2,000 patients for more than 19 uh, who are adult, more than 19 years, and multi and had obstructive disease and underwent PCI with PC, uh, with imaging. At one year, target visitor failure had occurred in 2.5 in the OCT guided group and 3.1 in the IVUS group. And Fuzigura concluded that OCT guided is non inferior to IVUS guided PCI. Again, we always have this question, and we have this on the panel most of the time, is which one you use, IVUS or OCT? Definitely OCT give you better resolution, give you better size, better characterization, characterization of the lesion. But again, if you don't have in the lab, IVUS can do as good as IVUS, and maybe with some kind of high-definition features that are absent in IVUS. But again, bottom line in this conclusion from the study and others is imaging is crucial for these patients with PCI. Frere A. Fib trial is assess the safety of switching anticoagulation strategies. Investigators switch patients from vitamin K antagonist, which is known as warfarin or coumadin, management for non vitamin non vitamin K antagonist or NOAC based treatment. The patient population of interest was all patients who are frail, elderly, and has AFib. So the risk here for patients with bleeding will be higher because they are elderly and frail. So switching from vitamin K antagonist treatment to NOAC in these patients was associated with more bleeding complication than continuing vitamin K treatment. This higher bleeding risk was in NOAC was offset by a lower risk of thromboembolic event. No advice from the data safety or DCMB uh, was uh, tr uh, uh, bored and frail was terminated uh, early because of that. So what we can conclude from that, so if somebody is doing well on Coumadin and he's elderly or she is frail and elderly, just keep on the same medication for now. I don't think it's wise to switch them. Again, this is studied patients who are elderly and frail. Oncodvt is another trial that so determined the optimal duration of anticoagulation therapy for, with edixaban for adulated distal DVT. Oncodvt randomized 600 patients with active cancer and newly diagnosed isolated DVT to undergo anticoagulation with edoxaban. One group received edoxaban for 12 months, the other group received it for only three months. The 12 months group protocol was superior to three months protocol for the adduction of VTE in these patients. It's very interesting because the current guideline, the CHEST and other guidelines recommended anticoagulation for DVT treatment only for three months. But this trial showing that 12 months is favorable and superior. Again, there is what, there's some increase in bleeding, not clinically significant and not statistically significant, but something to keep in mind, especially in patients with cancer. So again, this is only in cohort of patients with cancer who have DVT. Longer is better in these patients. The October trial compared outcome between OCT-guided and angiographic-guided PCI revascularization of lesion involving coronary artery branch point, point meaning bifurcation. So this is a bifurcation trial using imaging and OCT. The trial concluded uh, or included uh, more than 1,200 patients, and they were randomized 600 to the OCT compared to angiographic guided only. And the occurrence of major cardiac event at two years comprised the endpoint of MACE, as well as death, target visitor vascularization, and failure, as well as ischemia-driven TLR. At two years, 10% of patients in the OCT guided PCI had experienced a primary endpoint event and the angiographic guided was 14%, so a difference of four points between the two groups. And uh, OCT guided uh, for complex and bifurcation lesion, a lesion could become more routine for improved prognosis and also outcome in these patients. Again, these are the findings are very interesting. Again, I, uh, I am really intrigued to see these results. The main message we should learn from all these trials is we have to do imaging. Regardless what imaging tools you have in your cath lab, IVUS or OCT, Imaging is better than angiography, bottom line. Finally, a real-time analysis of meta-analysis meta that uh, compared OCT compared to IVUS versus angiography, uh, guided PCI revascularization, uh, presented by Dr. Greg Stone at the meeting and presented at ESC. It concluded that IVUS or OCT guided PCI reduces target lesion failure, cardiac death, MI, and revascularization compared to angiography guided alone. The, the author concluded that these results underline the importance of intravascular imaging, as we mentioned earlier, from all the trials we just mentioned, to optimize stent outcome and patient prognosis after PCI. I think this is a very, uh, very uh, great meeting. I really enjoyed uh, uh, reading as well as following all the trials that presented. Always ESC bring kind of uh, practice changing trials and studies. Uh, there's other studies that are done uh, on structural heart as well uh, that we didn't cover today. 
but definitely I think the highlight of this meeting was uh, imaging and uh, intracoronary imaging. I think there's no excuse for intervention cardiologists to learn and practice on a routine basis for any patient with PCI imaging pre and post intervention to optimize therapy and improve outcome. Thank you all for joining me today. And, uh, and if you'd like to learn more about these trials, uh, please visit cardiologyupdate.com or follow along on social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. With that, thank you so much for watching. I am Shadi Reyes from Detroit, Michigan.